Hello everyone, welcome back to a special episode of the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. I am going to come to you today and we are going to look at an article from a Sword of the Lord paper from all the way back to April 21st, 1961. And you will notice on here, it says further answers to the post-tribulation teachers. Will the church escape the great tribulation by evangelist John Linton from Windsor, Canada. Now, I'm not familiar with John Linton, but I, when I saw this, I thought, how interesting, because I wanted to see what they were saying in the 1960s about this subject. It does appear to me, based on my observation, that in independent fundamental Baptist churches, most of what you hear echoed, parroted, repeated from Baptist preachers is a lot of it is hype and different things that were heavily pushed in the 1970s. And when and when I say that too, I'm not saying the doctrine originated in the 70s, but the um the way the doctrine is portrayed with the planes crashing and with a you know very uh thief in the night look, the people disappearing, vanishing, uh all that kind of stuff, you know, the the way they would talk about the one world government and Russia and all these things. These were heavily popularized talking points in the 70s. And so people will often date themselves by the way they portray all these things. I think it's very important, even with prophecy, if our teaching is biblical, our teaching should be timeless. And I intend to show you too, uh, hopefully this week, if I'm able to get to it, a unbelievable example just showing how untimeless the pre-trib doctrine is, and we are going to look at a very influential pre-tribulationist and how he was just dead wrong on so many levels. And yet we still see people today over 20 years later, making the same dumb mistakes because most eschatology, it is not based on timeless principles from the scriptures. It is based on modern day hype. And obviously how we interpret modern day events often is shaped by our eschatology. But the problem with that is then it's not going to be timeless because things change in history. And we've got to be careful to not make the Bible, try to force the Bible into fitting our speculation based on the idea that maybe the Lord's going to come in our day. He might not come back for another hundred years and things are going to look completely different. And then our teaching is not timeless. Our teaching will be completely irrelevant and unhelpful at all, even 50 years from now. And so we're going to see a lot of evidence of that. And so when it comes to most of the previous generation that is still trying to influence today's generation, and many on, in this generation are starting to do their own study, and they're in even pre-tribulationalists are changing a lot of rhetoric. They're up they're they're smart enough to update. It's like, you know, we can't say it this way anymore. This does not apply today. You know, the current events of today are not the current events of the 70. And so you have some pre-tribulations that have made some updates to make their doctrine relevant today. But then you do you have your post-tribulation crowd that's calling out a lot of this just dumb stuff, dumb, outdated stuff that people are saying. But again, the people from the seventies were so heavily influenced by the TV preachers, by the thief in the night uh, movie, by the late great planet earth. We will probably never get that junk out of their heads. The previous generations, I believe they, they will not see the coming of Christ. They will die before it happens. And it's going to be up to the next generation to get to the truth on these things. I think the previous generation is gone when it comes to the subject. We will never win them over and they will not live to see that they were wrong. Uh, that, that I'm, I'm convinced of that, but, uh, but he, and I, and I'll illustrate that more in the podcast. I do about this one video that I'm, I'm planning on showing you, but today I want to keep it about this article in the sword of the Lord, because um, one thing that's interesting about this is, again, this kind of takes us before the 70s, you know, where um, that has its very, it was a very powerful influence. This is before a lot of the, this is before Thief in the Night. This is before late great planet Earth. So we have different talk rhetoric 
We have different talking points. But at the same time, many of the biblical arguments between the uh, post-trib and the pre-trib you know, are still the same. And I want to show you this too, to show you how what is being taught today by people like myself is not new. Okay? In spite of what many of the uh, pre-trib protectors are trying to say, it is not new. And they also parrot each other. Let me tell you something about the previous generation. They still don't know how to use the internet. Therefore, they don't know how to do any research. The only research they do is searching the memory files in their own head. And it only goes back, well, in reality, for, with them, it only goes back to the 90s. You know, probably when a lot of them got started in the ministry and really got going. And so what a lot of these people will foolishly, ignorantly, falsely declare is they will trace back the lineage of the post-trib teaching. And, you know, and they always try to uh, talk about how it was hatched out of the deserts of Arizona, or they'll say that, you know, guys like Steven Anderson got it from Marvin Rosenthal, who got it from Roger Van Campen, who, or Roland Rasmussen, who got it from Roger Van Campen, who got it from Marvin Rosenthal is typically how it will go. That was what Sam Gipp said in the famous anti-Anderson conference. But I want to show you this here. So notice that this rapture question answer book uh, from Roger Van Camp is from 97. And so people say, you know, cause you can't really say it started in Arizona when Roland Rasmussen was teaching it, but there is that connection of Rasmussen to Anderson. And so they'll try to, you know, so they'll show how, you know, well, Rasmussen got it from Van Campen and Van Campen got it from Rosenthal who in 1990, you'll see here wrote a book called the pre wrath rapture of the church. Hey, okay? now, so um, notice those things there, and that's as far back as they go. And I've heard multiple preachers get up and literally poly parrot, you know, guys like Sam Gipp, and they go off of his supposed research that he did, and they will sh trace it back to the 1990s. Well, I've got physical evidence right here. It goes back farther than 1990. We've got it right here, April 21st. 1961 in the sword of the Lord. And so I'm going to read some of this to you and point out some things. And, and, and he gives some names. He gives some names of people who were teaching a post-tribulation rapture and the arguments that they were making that sound really familiar. And I looked up some of those people and I couldn't find out a whole lot, but I found a book by one of them. I'm probably going to order interested in hearing what they have to say. I am not here today to endorse those men that were post-trib then. I do not know what their beliefs were, uh, nor do I know if um, Evangelist Linton is accurately representing them. I would be a fool to assume that he is accurately representing them. Not saying he isn't, but I would be a fool to assume he is simply because in my lifetime, I've only come across a very few, maybe two preachers that I felt like were even honest when addressing the post-tribulation teaching. So, but either way, we'll look at what he has to say in the sword of the Lord. And there was a time they were able to cancel us from the papers. They could cancel us. You know, mo the, there was, you know, the regular guy didn't have access or the money to be on TV and the radio and all those things, but they can't cancel us from the internet. And because of that, we're seeing these arguments. There were, there were voices crying in the wilderness back then. And while they had a tough time getting the platform to get those things out there, we are seeing it grow today because we do have a platform and we've got, thankfully, a lot of the people fighting against us are still using these archaic methods <laughs> while we're using cell phones. You know, they're using landlines or tin cans with string to get their message out. And I hope they keep it going. Uh, but, e but either way, let's go ahead and read some of this article about will the church escape the great tribulation. It starts out saying, it is not enough for us who teach pre-tribulation rapture to present our own case. We must face objections from the other side. I, hey, I agree with that. Three cheers for him willing to acknowledge what the other side is saying. Most people run from it. They avoid it like the plague because they can't answer it. But there's always those arrogant enough to think that they can't answer it. So it goes on to say, is the tribulation the wrath of God. Whoa. 
were, were there people back then disputing and showing that the tribulation and the wrath are not the same? I thought that started in the 2000s. I thought that started in the last, you know, 10 or 20 years. No, they were arguing about that even back then. He says, we are charged with overlooking a distinction between these two, explaining the reason for the rapture. Paul declared in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, that the church is not appointed unto wrath. The wrath here, as the context shows, is the tribulation wrath, and the church obtains deliverance from it by being raptured, just as Paul described. So he tells us here that the wrath being explained is tribulation wrath in the context. I don't know where he got that. He does not explain where he got that. Now, if I may just guess, okay, based on uh, having talked to a lot of pre-tribbers, again, in theological books, they have declared all of the wrath or all of the tribulation is God's wrath. And therefore it's, it's just implied, but it, it, listen, anybody can go read first Thessalonians four and five, and there is nothing in there to indicate that the tribulation is God wrath. They, the church is told multiple times they will endure tribulation, but not God's wrath. So it's talked about, Hey, they were, they went through tribulation that they were appointed to the church in Thessalonica was literally going through tribulation, but they were not going through God's wrath, nor would they go through God's wrath. He does nothing in here to display how the context of the wrath in first Thessalonians five is the tribulation. Absolutely nothing. It is just assumed. And, you know, back then these big names with these big platforms, Nobody call them out on and you. You didn't have a way to call people out. Okay. What they would typically do, they would use their big platforms. They would tell you what the other person said, and then they would proceed to debunk it. Typically not even accurately representing it. And people do the same thing today in their pulpits all the time. They get up in their pulpits. I'll tell you what the other side's saying. And let me tell you, I think it's okay for you to do that, but you better be right in what you're saying. If you want to get up and you want to debunk anybody you should be honest otherwise you're just making a railing accusation and you are you're scum in my opinion get get these things or just may, maybe maybe you're a decent person you're just very ignorant about what you're talking about and uh, you should get right and uh it just if you don't know about something just don't mention it just preach what you believe and don't don't even address the opposition have the wisdom to do that. So let's read a little bit more. He says, forced to explain, not appointed us unto wrath, post-tribulationists do so by first denying that the great tribulation is the wrath of God and then trying to assert a period of wrath after the tribulation, separate from the tribulation, greater in severity and taking place just before Christ comes to earth. Boy, this is, Sounds like he's talking about what we are teaching today that supposedly was invented in the 90s. He's talking about this in 1961. Thus, they make the Bible to say, first, the tribulation, then the wrath of God, and then the visible coming of Christ. They claim the church will go through the tribulation, but will escape the wrath of God to be poured out in this supposed awful period of wrath after the tribulation is over. And before Christ comes to earth in this way, they explain not appointed us under wrath, which gets them out of one difficulty, but lands them into many more. This is what he just described. There is exactly what the pre wrath crowd is teaching today. The post trib pre wrath crowd. That is exactly what they teach. So what is he, what he is addressing here was, it was being taught in 1961. Okay. Eat it. Okay, eat it, Gip. Hey, Nick Sayers, I know you're probably watching this. Like, eat it. He thinks this stuff came from Arizona too. But it says, among those who make this clearly imaginary distinction are, he's given some names, Lad, Okenga, uh, Okenga and J. Sidlow Baxter. Dr. Ba Dr. Baxter writes, the great tribulation and the wrath of God are not identical referring to Okenga, 
Dr. Ladd says that Dr. Okanga has pointed out pre-tribulationists are an error in identifying tribulation and wrath. While Ladd himself states the great tribulation will consist of these two elements, tribulation at the hands of Antichrist and the wrath of God, these two are not to be confused. Boy, I mean, what, what in the world did, did Pastor Anderson run back in a time machine and like share YouTube videos with these guys or something? Cause I mean, un unless these people are lying, they're saying he invented it. Well, let's keep reading. Ladd then raises a very important question for his own position when he states, it is clear teaching of scripture that the church will never suffer the wrath of God. If the position rested on this fact alone, pre-tribulationism would be inevitable. Can they be shown to be one and the same? I submit nothing is easier to prove. All right. And before we uh, let him and, and try to prove some of this, let me just point out who these individuals are that he referenced. So uh, the first one I want to point out, this is George Eldon Ladd, who wrote a book called The Blessed Hope, a biblical study of the second advent and the rapture. And this is, look at that, 1956. Y'all see that? 1956. And I don't know what all he teaches in this book. All I know is what is being addressed here uh, are things that people like myself are teaching. And in 1956, apparently it was being taught by George Eldon Ladd. Here's another name that was mentioned. I found a Wikipedia. I couldn't find his books online. But James Sidlow Baxter, uh, he was born in Australia in 1903, died in 99, pastor, theologian, later served as an evangelist. He authored as many as 30 books. And so, um, so you know, he, this, but yeah, Jay Sidlow Baxter is somebody else that he called out for teaching this very thing. And then another one he mentioned is Dr. Harold Okenga. And I couldn't find his book either. Um, I, I, I found a title for it, but here's an article called the, the biblical case for mid tribulationism. And it refers to some of his stuff. And so here on Wikipedia for rapture, it mentions mid tribulationist teachers, including, and it mentions Harold Okenga, assuming I'm saying that right. So, um, either way, I really don't know anything about these three guys. I learned all their names today, but either way, um, these are people that were teaching the same thing as me. They might've had many other beliefs that were very different, that very, very well me. They might have beliefs that were heretical. I, I don't know. Um, and in the description of the one book, things to come, one of the tags on it was a millennial. I don't know if that was their position on that, but either way, the things that this pre-tribulationist is addre addressing is exactly what is being taught by many in the pre-wrath camp today. Just showing that these this is not new to this generation. And so let's go ahead and read a little bit more. It says, referring to this supposed period of wrath, Baxter writes that the wrath of God is the last awful end bit, which immediately follows Matthew 24, 29, the great tribulation. And... and let me just say, you know, the, the previous generation and, and there are many of them still today, they do, they are so good at getting up and arrogantly pontificating on their positions, but they will never, they, they will never allow themselves to be publicly challenged by the very individuals they are addressing. It is amazing how bold people are and how quick they are to call out names from behind their pulpit from behind a YouTube video video camera. But when the person is there to speak for themselves and to call them out on their misrepresentations, they are terrified of it. Listen, if, if you are, if you're, if you think, don't tell me you're bold in calling out people that you will are afraid to call out to their face. I'm not saying you have to address everybody that you call out to the face, but just don't act like you're bold, okay? And again, I don't care how bad they are, you accurately represent them. Okay? Just because you know, you're know right in doctrine, you might be better than them in some areas, maybe you're saved and they're not saved, doesn't give you permission to lie about them. If you do, 
you're lame and you're a coward. You know, that, that that's all there is to it. We shouldn't be afraid of this kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, when he, when he's pointing out this stuff, um, you know, it, it is, it's like, it, it's one of those things where, again, I read it. And it's like, am I sure he's accurately representing the other side? You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm definitely not going to assume that based on Baptist history because Baptists are so bad uh, at accurately representing the other side. But, but either way, you know, a, just a little study on the day of the Lord. Okay. The day of the Lord. Okay, I'm talking to you pre-trivers right now. Go do a study on the day of the Lord. It is the day of wrath. You go read all the Old Testament passages about the day of the Lord, and it's always talking about God's wrath. God's wrath comes on the day of the Lord. First Thessalonians 5, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Hey, and sorry, he's pointing out Matt, he, he, how the post-tribulation guys say Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation, that God's wrath is some time period after that. Well, of course it is. Listen, you can't believe the Bible. You can't take the Bible literally and act like the day of the Lord comes before or that God's wrath comes before the day of the Lord. The Bible says too, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. The day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath and the sun is darkened and moon turned to blood before the day of the Lord and the, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon shall not give her light. That is the sixth seal. And it's after the tribulation. And that's when the day of the Lord comes after the tribulation, after the sun is darkened and the moon turned to blood, then God's wrath comes on the earth. Just do a study on the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath. And the day of the Lord comes after the tribulation. After the sun is dark and moon turned to blood, that is spelled out, that is indisputable, that is just plain English right there. So apparently, the person he is addressing clearly understood that and was teaching that, but he just he just dismisses it. He doesn't he doesn't prove anything different. But let's read a little more of what he says. <clears throat> so he says immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So I have added verse 30 there for clarity. I leave it with my readers to see if there is any such period of wrath mentioned there as for the other writers, they offer no proof. And for that reason, no such proof exists. On the contrary, the evidence against it is overwhelming. So because he does not see a period in between after the tribulation and Christ coming in the clouds, he assumes there can't be a period of wrath. Here's where he's making his mistake. And I don't know what these guys position were. I'm just telling you what mine is now. That is the rapture. He just doesn't believe that's a rapture. He believes that that's Armageddon. That's obviously what's going on there. But in our world, in the pre post trib pre wrath world, we believe that is in fact the rapture. So um, there is time for a period of God's wrath. We put revelation 19 later. So he, so either, and the thing is, I would be interested in reading these guys books and seeing if they taught the same thing, because it would be very interesting if they did. Because this argument he is making against them is exactly the argument most pre-tribbers, most of them, with the rare exception, most pre-tribbers say the exact same thing about us. You know why? Because they've never actually talked to us. They've never actually looked into it. They've just listened to straw men and assumed that the preachers they were listening to build those straw men were telling the truth and accurately representing, and they weren't. So I, I would be very interested in seeing that. And again, this is why, you know, the, the pre-tribulation crowd, their inability to see the truth of what we're saying tells me one of two things. Either they are incapable of just hearing anything and understanding anything that, you know, is not in one of their uh, theological books, you know, or they're all liars 
who are misrepresenting what post tribbers teach. I doubt they're all liars. I think they're mainly just ignorant. That's probably the case with this guy. I hope you all aren't liars. I like pre-tribbers, but I don't like I don't like liars. So I, you know, when I hear pre-tribbers talk about, you know, them post-tribbers, you know, they think we're gonna go right back up and come right back down, you know. Uh, okay, listen, I don't think you're a liar. I think you're ignorant. Okay, and, and that that's what I think. And so um, because I don't know enough about what these guys teach, this, you know, what he's showing here, I think is um it could be just displaying ignorance that he doesn't realize no these guys also believed that this was the rapture and armageddon came later and because he has the position this is armageddon therefore you know it doesn't make sense but that's why we have so he is acknowledging we have a disagreement on what tribulation and wrath are good let's talk about that and he he's kind of trying to he's failing but we also have a disagreement on which passages are references to the rapture and which are references to Armageddon. We have, and that's another, and that's just another subject where we disagree. So he doesn't address that though. And again, I don't know. I don't know for sure what those guys taught. So, um, but either way, he goes on to say one illuminating phrase from our Lord himself shatters this interpretation completely. How could there be a period of wrath and judgment after the tribulation? And I got to turn here to page five. How can there be a period of wrath and judgment after the tribulation? Because again, he's assuming, a, well, for one, he's assuming everything's in Daniel's 70th week. And we've talked a lot about that. Don't know what these guys position were on that. But again, everybody's, everybody assumes the tribulation is seven years, even though that is not explicitly stated anywhere in the scripture that the tribulation is seven years. You can fit the tribulation and the wrath period in seven years. Don't know what these guys that he's referring to did, uh, but I'm just saying it's like he is completely oblivious to certain things and the pre-tribbers today are completely oblivious. And it's like, dude, all you got to do is ask. We will tell you. You don't even have to ask what we think. We will tell you. <laughs> and so if you don't know, it's because you're not listening. You've not looked. You are just, uh, I think the problem with a lot of these people, they're reading their Bibles and the Bible is challenging their pre-trib position. And they're, instead of taking out their argument with the Bible and the Holy Spirit, you know, they're just attacking those post-tribbers that are out there and they don't even know what we teach. I think you're fighting the Bible and the Holy Spirit that's messing with you. That's what I personally think, but let's keep reading. Uh, so I forgot, how, but it goes on to say, and worse than the tribulation, when Christ stated that the suffering, anguish, and severity of the great tribulation, which such as never again shall be, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be, that should be all one needs to say to dispose of an assumption that clearly contradicts scripture. The supposed period of wrath apart from and after the tribulation is a mere assumption, unproven and unprovable. The words of our Lord, nor never shall be, give the death blow to this event invention. So, well, first off, if Jesus is addressing trouble that's going to come on his people, okay, now there's where we have another argument. You all believe it's the Jews. We believe it's the Christians, okay? If it's the worst time that has ever come on believers and then they are taken out. Okay. Then fulfilled. Okay. It didn't. So the thing is when God pours his wrath out on the world, that whole comparison or that whole statement, it's going to be the worst that there ever was. It doesn't apply to them because the tribulation is something that the, the believers are going through where God's wrath is something his people are going through. Are, are we going to say that the lake of fire is not as bad as God's wrath, you know, that comes on the world? I don't care what's going on in the world. Anything on this world is going to be better than burning in a lake of fire. And so uh, it's, that doesn't work. Okay. That doesn't work. It's just, it, it appears that this man misunderstands, you know, what these people are teaching and again, I've not read their books, so I can't tell you exactly what they taught. I just think it's funny how his reasoning he's using is the same false, faulty, ignorant reasoning that many people are using today. 
So we'll read a little bit more. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. It's pretty long, but uh, most of this stuff we're reading here is just showing how he is addressing the very things that people like myself are teaching. But it goes on to say, but further this alleged period of wrath after the tribulation and before Christ coming to earth is contradicted by the very verse Baxter uses to prove his point. Verse 29 reads, Immediately after the tribulation, Christ comes in the clouds of heaven to the earth. Where is there room for any period? Now, where do we see him stepping on earth? Where do we see that? You inserted that in there because that's in your textbooks. That that's Armageddon, his footsteps on the Mount of Olives in that day. Where do you see his foot stepping on the Mount of Olives in that day? You don't. You know why? Because it's not there. Okay, your your prophecy books combine all those things together, but that's not what post tribulationists teach. So again, these these slam dunk things he keeps bringing up, they don't work. They absolutely don't work, and he is addressing exactly what people like myself have been teaching, proving that this stuff isn't new. And I, I submit to you, there have always, there have always been people preaching the things that people like myself are preaching, but they are hard to find in history. You know why? God never promised to preserve the words of Pastor Tommy McMurtry. He never promised to preserve the words of the um, Okinga and uh, forgot the names of the other men he mentioned already. I need to learn these people's names. Uh, so we can give him credit with, um, George Ladd. God never promised to preserve their words, but he promised to preserve his words. Now you want to, and even today said the people teaching this stuff today, there is no guarantee a hundred years from now, people are going to be talking about what people like myself taught, but you know who they will be talking about? Tim LaHaye, the big names, John Hagee, you know, Billy Graham. Those names will be remembered. And today in the present, we understand how heretical these men are. We get that. But history always sanitizes people's teachings and records and all that stuff. And it's the same thing. You go back in history. These people, it, just a little bit of study, they are tainted with Catholicism, Calvinism, all kinds of junk. And people will use these things as proof that this is what historical Christianity has always been about. No, you're just showing me what the mainstream big names were teaching during that time. Are we going to base sound doctrine off what the mainstream big name preachers are preaching today? Boy, that would be a huge mistake if we did something like that. But what's interesting is all, you know, all I've heard many preachers in one sermon, practically in one sentence, you know, or in one sentence, they'll say, nobody ever taught, you know, X, Y, and Z about repentance. And then they will give quotes from Charles Spurgeon saying stuff about repentance, where he is addressing the very position on repentance people like myself have. It's like, well, wait a minute. If what we believe is brand new on repentance, why was Charles Spurgeon attacking this position? Who are these people he's referring to? I've read quotes. We're talking about there's some out there preach, you know, they're teaching repentance is this and re teaching repentance is that. And it's exactly what I believe. And then people are like, you know, that's, that's a new teaching. No, it's not. Okay. Listen, the mainstream big names have always been against the spirit filled believers and, and the true churches. And if you think Saddleback church is one of the true churches of today, you're crazy. But you know what? I believe history will smile on churches like that. It, they always seem to do that. You know, people are going to want, 50 years from now, people are going to want to claim Billy Graham. That's already happening. Some Baptists are already speaking respectfully of Billy Graham, even though my whole life, he has always been the picture of compromise, the modern day embodiment of Balaam. That's who he's always, that's a, or, uh, yeah, is it Balaam? It's who he's all, uh, or, uh, whoever it was that had the donkey speak to him. And, uh, he, he's always been the embodiment of that. And so, but either, either way throughout history, you can always find the big names attacking teaching like what people like myself teach and people will use that. I've heard many people too. They scoff at a lot of the Baptist history that is out there and the things that people teach. And you know what they always say? They will always refer 
to big names and what they said about these groups. And you know what they always said about these groups? They called them cults. Isn't that interesting? Boy, we hear a lot of that same thing today too. So folks, there's nothing new. The things that we teach, I challenge anybody, go listen to any pre-tribber and any post-tribber and compare Bible usage. Okay. And I'm not saying pre-tribbers don't sometimes use a lot of Bible. Okay. Sometimes they do. They misuse it. They connect things that aren't connected, but there is a clear difference and you will see much more consistency with the post-tribbers and with the pre-tribbers and most of the time, a lot more scripture. And so this stuff's been being fought for a long time. In fact, I, I'm not going to go through this. I didn't even read all of it because it was, it was painfully boring and, um, and I don't want to be speak disrespectful because I do know who this individual is. I did have the privilege of meeting him here and him preach one time when he was in his nineties, but right here, I have an article from November 1st, 1957 by Lee Robertson saying, will the church go through the tribulation and folks, when you read this, it's like, dude, he's literally just quoting textbook stuff here. There is no expounding of scripture whatsoever. I mean, it's just the usual talking points that we always hear, but I'll, I'll just read uh, the, uh, the main points that he has listed here. And the one is the coming of Christ is imminent. Okay. And we've majorly disproven imminency. Another word you can't find in the Bible, but you can find in every pre-trib writing. You know why? Because they all get it from the same textbooks. So they all use the same words and phrases. You can't find, listen, I know, understand the word imminency or the word imminent isn't in the Bible. And just put a word not in the Bible doesn't mean a concept isn't, but you can't even find the concept. And you for sure can't find a word. And the truth is, if you're teaching a concept that is in the Bible, you should be able to find a, a Bible word that represents that con concept. And you can't, they, they have to use a word that's not in the Bible. Okay? Again, I sometimes use extra biblical terms, but you know what, call me out on it. And I can always use a biblical term that actually gives greater clarity to, to the argument. But pre-tribbers are dependent on extra biblical terms, kind of like the Calvinists when it comes to issues of salvation. But the second point he has, the tribulation begins when Christ is, or when the church is caught up and the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world. That folks, we've proven over and over again too, that bizarre teaching is straight out of the Schofield notes. That's all there is to it. We've already shown uh, that that absolutely in no way teaches that at all. And so it, it is, I mean, this is like, it's, you know, the, the stuff that's just parroted in here, there's literally no coherent argument. He just says a lot of nice emotional stuff, says a lot of true stuff, but it doesn't, none of it, it it's all proving we're not here for God's wrath. That's all it is. Will the church go through tribulation and then he proceeds to show how we're not here for God's wrath. But here in this other article, we showed you someone trying to prove tribulation and wrath are the same thing. And he failed miserably. If you believe tribulation and wrath are the same, then you believe God's wrath is poured out before the day of the Lord. Go just look up, get on your, just get on your sword searcher and look up day of the Lord and just start and start reading it. And you will see, in fact, I'm going to do it right now. Day of the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to read some passages to you. Let me do exact phrase. All right. So Isaiah 2, 12, uh, for the day of the Lord of hosts is upon everyone that is proud and lofty. Everyone that is lifted up, he shall be brought low. Okay. So it sounds like God is definitely upset. It doesn't explicitly say wrath there. Uh, Isaiah 13, 6, how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as destruction from the almighty. There shall all hands be faint and every man's heart shall melt and they sh shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travailed. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and ye shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. That kind of sounds like 
Revelation 6. Isaiah 34, 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Jeremiah 46, 10, for this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries and the sword shall devour and it shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood for the Lord God of hosts hath the sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Lamentations 2.22, thou hast called as in a solemn day my terrors round about, so that is the day of the Lord's anger. None shall, uh, and none escaped, nor remain. Those that I have swaddled and brought up hath mine enemy consumed. So again, all you have to do is just read all these verses about the day of the Lord. And folks, the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before, before the day of the Lord come. Immediately. After the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned to darkness. The moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So if you believe tribulation and the wrath are the same thing, you believe God's wrath comes before the day of the Lord and just admit it. Right? Just admit it. They are not the same. And God bless these men that were teaching that back in the 1960s. Good for them. We are not alone. And you know what? I'm thankful for them. And you know what? Let's keep on carrying that torch and proclaiming the truth. The tribulation and the wrath are not the same thing. That is something that theologians, pre-tribulational, dispensational theologians came up with. It is false. It is completely wrong. And it is not new. It did not start in the 90s. It did not start in Arizona. They were fighting about it in the 60s. There's your proof. Again, doesn't prove anything. Just proves pre-tribbers are wrong about one more thing. That's all it does. They were fighting about it in the 60s. Here's the proof. Pre-tribbers are wrong about yet another thing. So anyway, I hope this was a help to you. Thank you all for watching. Make sure you like, share, spread the word on this. Rub the pre-tribbers' noses in it. Nick Sayers, eat it. They were preaching this in the 60s. Sam Gipp, eat it. They were teaching this in the 60s. You didn't do your research, buddy. You can eat it. I got it right here. Proof that y'all are wrong again. Not trying to gloat, but I'm gloating. So thank you all for watching. We will see you all next time.